I am delighted to be here at the Polytechnic of Milano when it celebrates 150 years. This is an extraordinary institution, one of the great schools of architecture of the world. So for me, it's a great privilege to be speaking here. I will be showing you some, some work of mine, recent, recent work, although I'll start with a project that is not recent, but you will see why, just to talk about what motivates me and what in my mind makes architecture. So if we can start, that is Los Angeles, California. Now, very important, the city of Los Angeles is what you have there. I have it perfectly fine, Stefano. The city of Los Angeles is what occupies that gray area. But there is pieces inside the city that are not part of the city because the city of Los Angeles grew by aggregating many other small pieces of land. And in that small piece of land, we were asked to design a building. Actually, it's not so small, but for, given the size of Los Angeles, it is. And we designed the Pacific Design Center. I started designing that building in, in 1971, many years ago. See, I was very young then. <laughs> uh, in, in 1985, we were asked to expand the building right, in stages. Very difficult thing to do. And this is what we proposed. And the, the green building did get built. The red, you know, in, in around 1989, 1990. What was wonderful is that when we this were able to expand, we were also able to build the piazza, which is very important. That suddenly this became a public space that before it was not, with many, many activities, very busy piazza. And the wonderful thing was that in this piece of nowhere, it was a part of the county of Los Angeles, the people started getting together and they decided to make a city. And now it is the city of West Hollywood inside Los Angeles. But it is its own independent city, thanks to the space that we provided as our architects. And then the red building started to happen and there, there it is the almost, almost finished, not completely. That's the red building, as I said, not completely finished. It hasn't been washed yet, so it's, it, will, it will have more color than it shows here. That's the red building on the main avenue, San Vicente Boulevard, and from the north end of the building. Now, what is important about this project for me is that I started designing that project 42 years ago, and it's still not finished. And this is, this is longer than any other project I have been involved with, but it is typical of many architectural projects is that they take many, many years to get finished. So you have to get ready to wait. Waiting is very important in architecture. We do a lot of that. Now, this is, as you will see, in New Haven, Connecticut, where I live, where Yale University is, and we designed two pedestrian bridges, tiny bridges, just for pedestrians. But we work with a very creative engineer, and what I wanted was to design an absolute minimal bridge. And this bridge, all it has is two handrails, and the handrails are the structure. Uh, the floor in between just spans between the two handrails, uh, and it, there are pieces of wood that you see down through the, through the pieces of wood. A very simple, very handsome bridge. That shows it's a single sheet of half-inch steel, special super-strength steel that has been cut, and it undulates to avoid bending in the, on the structure. Very simple, so we, don't, so we don't need any reinforcements, we don't need any secondary elements. It's just the top element, the bottom element, and the handrail itself. Now, this is in, where, where, where am I? <laughs> in, 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 in New Orleans, 
we designed a church. The first time I designed a church for, for St. Xavier University. And the light all comes behind a perforated screen that looks like that. And it creates a very lively, soft space. And I, we also were able to get permission from the archbishop not to have a cross, but to have a Christ ascending, which is to me much more optimistic. This is after Christ has died and he ascends to heaven, that's what we have here. <laughs> now, this in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, this is in the north of the United States, we have designed, we designed a library. Well, for me, it was very, I love libraries, I love books, but today libraries are in a crisis because I don't need to go to a library to check up information. I have it here in my iPhone or, or in an iPad like the lady here. It's, that's how we check today. But so what will happen with libraries? So one thing that we know for sure is that they will need to change. So the main thing we did was to do a very flexible library. Also, urbanistically, the library was in an interesting position between two different grids. This had been two urban settlements, obviously, on the Mississippi River, that as they grew, each one had its own regular grid. And the library in between had those two main avenues. To the left is called Hennepin Avenue. To the right is the Nicolette Mall. And we were required to put entrances to the library on the two avenues, which is in a library, you are not allowed to put two entrances so that we had to create a public passageway and an inner entrance to the library. So we divided the library in two pieces that respond to the east and the west of the city with the plants like that. To the north, we had the public spaces and to the south, the private aspects of the library. And there it is. The main space of the library carries through through Hennepin Avenue so that you can know where the library is many, many blocks away. I wanted to make the library even more public than a library normally is. And we used a frit glass to reduce the amount of light that enters the library. And what we have on the glass are birch trees, like birch trees are now also growing in front of the library. And uh, that's the public space inside the library, connected with bridges at every level. And inside, we have a very simple structural system, columns with mushroom tops and a slab, no beams and no, no nothing on the ceiling. And the, under the floor, the floor suspends over the slab. There we have all of the distribution air, electricity, electronics, everything. So if they need to change a partition, they can do it in a weekend very easily so that the library will be able to adapt. And as you can see already, more people are in computers than with books inside the library. And there are places for children and many different places to sit down and read comfortably. That's another one. This is my favorite. This is, I love this place because this looks towards the Mississippi River. Now, this is in Oklahoma, in the city of Tulsa in Oklahoma. We designed an event center. They used to be called arenas. Today, they are event centers, which is, looks like that. The, the, so we'll sit 18,000 people for basketball games or for concerts primarily popular artists. One enters under the cantilever. It's all stainless steel and glass. That's all you see outside. And there it is at night. And the interior, and what I was able to achieve, it was not easy, was we were able to devise a ramp by which you can go with wheelchairs, if you wish, or walking from the bottom level to the top level of the arena. So there are also escalators and stairs and elevators, but 
90% of the people prefer the ramp. And no, as, I, as I said, all sorts of things happen here. This is a circus, very popular circus. Now, this is in London, England, just to show the variety of projects we do and how we respond to all of them. The most interesting and most difficult thing about this project is that it's on Victoria Street, where that little red circle is, and it's on the view of Buckingham Palace and on the view of the Victoria Monument. And that was a silhouette that nobody can change, so that it was very difficult to design a building there without changing the silhouette. So we had to make innumerable presentations, 12 different boards that had to approve this. That's very simple floor plan, very efficient. And those are the part of the documents we had to present showing how it is today on the top and how it will be tomorrow at the bottom. You can hardly see the change, but they thought that that was too much and the developer was asked to take a floor off the building. But, but that is the building, approved and finished. And, and the queen likes it. <laughs> very simple building, very small building, 14 stories. Now, this is in, in Spain, in Bilbao, in the Basque Country. This was a competition that we participated 20 years ago, 1993. Bilbao used to have be the main port of northern Spain, way to the right. Today it has become outdated because most of the mercancies go in containers, and they, have not, they don't have the area for it. This whole area that you see at the left on, on, the, on the Bay of Biscay, those are large areas for containers. So the, the, new, the new port is like 50 times larger than the old port, but it is not in the city of Bilbao itself. That left an area where one can work, where one can to do extend, extend the city. When we started working on this, also they asked Frank Gehrig to design the Guggenheim Museum at the far end to the right in this very same area. And we entered a competition there that we won. That was how this was. This was just warehouses, railroad yards, and in order to create this flat land, they had to cut a six meter high wall between this area and the city. So the city was completely disconnected from the water. That's how it was. And this was what we proposed in 1993, was to extend the grid of the city, extend where the main streets are, and to organize the new plants on this basis. And to create another circular piazza that are very common in Bilbao. That's how the plan developed. That's how it took form in 2005. And that's how when we started building. That was the Guggenheim and just, just the flat area. That's the Guggenheim, extraordinary building, one of the most famous buildings of our time so that everybody design it here, has to treat it with great respect. And that's the, the, new, the new development. What we created was a wonderful walk park, a lineal park, we decided, called it, at the edge of the river, intensely used. And then it is almost completely finished. There is only one empty site that now is starting construction, so finally it's going to be finished in, in about 25 years, at least much shorter. You can see a little bit of the Guggenheim on the far right. There it is, you can see the Guggenheim on the back and how all of this connects. And that's very, the, the lineal park is very much used. The people in Bilbao obviously have been anxious for 100 years to get to the water. And now they do. And people come, as you can see, they push baby carriages, the students come here. Everybody comes to this area. The, uh, you can see how, uh, and it has become the main way to approach the Guggenheim Museum. 
very few seconds. Now, these several architects have worked here following our master plan, but each one has complete freedom and stylistic freedom. This was a Basque architect, Eugenio Aguinaga. This was a very famous Viennese architect, Rob, Robert Creer, the brother of Leon Creer, which did, I'm not very happy with what the way it looked. He, he thought that the, they should, the building should not look like one building, but like a collection of buildings in small scale. It's a similar idea that Aldo Rossi had in his development in Berlin, same, same idea. And, and this is Ricardo Legorreta, did a, a hotel. This is Alvaro Sisa, who, who did a conference center for the Basque University. And Rafael Moneo, who did a library for the Jesuit University Deusto across the river. And other architects did many more, 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 more housing. This is Carlos Ferrater from Barcelona. And we did the tower. Now, this was how the view from the very center of town was towards our project. The building you see there is further, much further away across the river. Today, that looks like that. We designed a building for a company called Iberdrola, an L energy company that deals in energies, an international company. There it is. We have placed it purposefully away from the edge of, this, of the city, so that it's, the, the tower itself is, as you walk as a pedestrian, the tower is hidden. But it marks the center of Abandu Ibarra on the skyline, and we have just a very long canopy that allows you to go from your car to the building and not, not getting wet by the rain. And that's the lobby. We have planted three olive trees, three to 400 years old each, extraordinary marvelous trees. And these trees are perfect for this because they don't yield any fruit anymore, but they are magnificent specimens. And we were able to get this lovely stair built without any intermediate structure. Now, this is also in Spain, very different part of Spain. This is a very, very different climate, and a very different people, very different history, and very different view of the world. And we also, this was also another competition that we want to design this tower for then was a, a, a savings bank, a caja, caja sol. Today, this is part of the Caixa from Barcelona. And in Seville, where the sun is so bright and so hot, we decided a system of sunshades that will not allow any sunlight to enter into the building. But also the building will have a look and a color very much like Seville, so it's gonna be a tower that there are no towers in Seville. This will be a first tower. But it is across the river Guadalquivir. It's not in the city itself. It's across the river, and it will be ve feel very civilian. That's how it is today. It has reached the top, although it isn't finished. That you see from the river Guadalquivir. Now, this is in Santiago, Chile. It's what we have designed is a very tall tower, 300 meters high, called Torre Costanera, and it's against the Andes. And Santiago is quite beautiful because the Andes are right there, so that they create a backdrop for anything one designs and builds there. And this is San Francisco, California. This is at the edge of the financial district. This is a multimodal center, primarily for commuter buses, commuter trains, and, and rapid rail trains. And this was also an international competition that we won, probably because we proposed to build a public park on the roof of the station. As you can see, in all of our projects, 
we try to exploit the public aspects of the project as much as possible. I believe this, this is partly of our obligation as architects to try to benefit the general public as much as we can. So this is a complex building, ground floor, the main entrance is where the red lines are. The second floor, the one at the bottom, has some shops, and the top floor has commuter buses. Those come from eight different cities around San Francisco. And the roof garden. If we go below grade, on top there is an area where we shops and you can buy tickets and wait, and at the bottom is where the trains are. That's the section. As you can see again, the park on the top, buses, public, entrance to the train station, and to the right are commuter trains, to the left are the rapid rail trains that I hope will ever, sometime will be built in America, probably this will be the first ones to get built. Those will connect San Francisco with Los Angeles and San Diego. And to give form to the whole space, this is enclosed in a stainless steel perforated metal grid that allows for the air to flow through, not to require any air conditioning or heating, but to give form to the space and to give quality to the space. And this is an interesting issue, it's because the pieces taking this complex form are not exactly rectangular. They are all slightly deformed. So we needed a, a pattern that would not show this. And we ended up using a pattern that was developed by a, by a scientist, a physicist called Roger Penrose, who has a Nobel Prize, who developed this pattern that extends forever and it never repeats itself with a very simple set of, of forms. So this will have the Penrose pattern in all of those panels. And that will be the main space. And what you see there is the work of two artists, where we five artists were, were here. Jade Gong is doing the floor patterns, and Jenny Holzer is doing the, 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 the art piece on the top. Sorry, I'm marking here, you cannot see that. And the park, which will be the most important part of the building in my mind. And also a tower that we are designing for Heinz, our same client that we have here in Milan. And that's under construction already. This has been, they have been building for three years now because we have huge geothermal wells under the building that will make the building completely self-sustainable. And that's how the tower will look in the skyline of San Francisco. An exception has been made for this tower in the city code that allows this tower to be much taller than other buildings can be in San Francisco. This is very useful to present to the public, people who may not be able to read drawings or plans, but can understand the, 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 the things in, in movement. A very large park, about three hectares in size. Very important because just south of this area, there's a whole new residential neighborhood being built that will be very important to have a, a, a public area. This goes for several blocks, so the streets cross it under. That's why we have to lift the whole set of elements into the air. and will be very active with shops on the perimeter. That's the tower. This is the street that where the camera is going. It's called Mission Street, a very important street in San Francisco. This will be the main entrance to the station.
and there will be a funicular that also will take you to the roof, to the park. The funicular carries very few people, but it is immediately, it attracts visitors. There will also be staircases, escalators, elevators that will take you to the, to the park. And you will be able to see the park from almost everywhere in the station, even from the ground floor. And the natural light will reach the second basement where the trains are. This is the top floor where the, where the commuter buses are. And this is the bottom floor where the trains are. That's all of San Francisco, the downtown San Francisco, the business, the business financial center. The tower to the right is the Transamerica Tower, today the tallest building in San Francisco. That, that, that is that. Now I, I will, I'm going to Milan, <laughs> and I will like to show you the project we have been working on in Milan that is almost finished, so that you can go and visit by yourself and judge by yourself. Now, I, I would like to say, in this project we have had great collaboration. We have had a very supportive client that was also collaborated with us, a guy, this is Manfredo Catella is here, Wave your hand, Manfredi. <laughs> and, and also my partner, Greg Jones. Greg? Greg? Greg is one of my partners in, in the firm. He was, 35 years ago, he was my student at Yale University. Then he came to work with us, and now he is my partner. And he has been dedicated to this project, so he really knows when I, you ask me questions, I'll ask him to come with me. He, he knows a lot more than I do about this project. But this is where, you know, I don't need to explain it to you, but I have this slide to explain to people in other parts of the world where, where the, the, the Gari, Puerto Nuova Garibaldi is, because the competition that we participated in about 12 years ago was only for what we call today Porta Nuova Garibaldi. That was all that was available at that moment. And that was the ground as it existed. As you know, it had been undeveloped since the Second World War. Very difficult site for a number of reasons. One is because there are so many subway lines and train lines intersecting the site that makes it very difficult and expensive to build on top. So in our design, we were very careful not to build, put buildings right over the subway lines, because that's very ex extraordinarily expensive. Uh, but the main thing we did, as you, and also to create lines of connection in all directions for pedestrians. So this would be a very, it is already a very accessible group of buildings. But the most important things we did was to this, create in the middle of this place a public space. This is the heart of the project for me. That's the soul of the project. The buildings are there to give form to the public space, in my mind. But that's, that's the form of the space. Those are the three towers that, that we have designed that now Unicredit is using. And at the ground floor, we reduce the size of the circle to make it more the size of a traditional Italian piazza. But also as to create a lower scale around the piazza so that it makes it more human scale and friendly, not the wall of a tall building, but a smaller scale that will be surrounded with shops and restaurants and cafes. There is only one now at in, in the corner, very soon, every one of those spaces will be filled. I understand that the opposite end 
or the cafe that now exists, there will be an Apple store, which are fantastic and very active. And that's the model we produced at that time. And as you can see, the important thing is the, is the inner space that we produced. And now, this is what Porta Nuova is now, and actually keeps on growing, so it may be out of date. We did the, the Porta Nova Garibaldi, the there's Porta Nova Barracino, and the Isola at the right, where, where Stefano here has designed two fantastically beautiful buildings, the, the Bosco Verticale. And that's a view as, as the project has developed, that's the view of the space as it was taken for. And another view with a, with a very important and very large public park that is being designed by a, by a Dutch firm outside inside. Now that starts to show some of the complexity. As you can see, we have listed the ground floor six meters up. This allows for pedestrians to move over all of the side streets without having to cross traffic. And, and, and that allows the park to cover the train station, the train line that comes, up, comes at that point, comes above grade, to cover it, make it disappear, and to connect the park directly with this whole project. Now, this also shows how the main connections we have, and, and I'll tell you some of the main architects that are working here, I probably will forget some names, but on, on Isola, which is the space on the top, you all know where Isola is, it's of course there are two build, three buildings by Stefano Boeri here, and there is a small office building by Bill McDonald, and another smaller building by, by Lagrange. In the Garibaldi area, besides us, there are the two buildings that connect the, 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 the Piazza Gaio, Gaio Lenti, and I'm very happy because I was a good friend of Gaio Lenti. She was a great architect and a great designer. So that the connections of Gaio Lenti with Corso Como was, this, was designed by, by, by Muñoz Albin, who did a lovely, lovely work. Once those, those shops are full of people, I think it's gonna be a fantastic place. And, and, one wonderful place to have. And the, the, next, the next tower to the right was designed by Chino Tsuki. And the large building that extends from, from Gaio Lenti was, was designed by Pio Arc. Then there was a bridge that crosses the, 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 the village Joya, was designed by Arup. And the, the towers, the first pair of towers, as you cross the Joya, were designed by Architectonica in Miami. And the, the buildings, in the, in the next door buildings were designed by Caputo and then K, KPF. And the Antonio Criterio did the shops, and M2P did those very lovely townhouses on, on, the, on the southern street. We call it Viale del Sur, but I don't know what official name it will, it will finally have. But so it's, it's also a, a great collection of very good architects that takes to create a space like that. This is not anybody's single work. This is a great collaborative work. So that shows some of the complexities of the, of the section, how it all has to work. See, that's a blow up. Originally, when we designed, there was a third proposed subway line that was almost near the surface. Fortunately, it was abandoned and moved somewhere else. But those are some of the subway lines that exist and how the pedestrians are allowed to cross over. You, will, you are not even aware that you are going over streets and subways. And that's the connection of Corso Como with the main building. And today, it's mostly people walking out of the buildings Unit credit to go and have lunch in Corso Como. We saw that a huge number of people today at lunch. In the future, there will many will be stopping in between because there will be restaurants in between. And that's the first, the first functional element that gives you an idea of what the piazza will be like. The piazza was, was designed by a collaboration of, of, of uh, Edo and land. 
the, the, the two landscape designers. And although nothing is functioning, the perimeter are delighted to see very many people there today. And the, the, the water is lovely, and the, the, the water also can be drained, and one can use it that area for spectacles. Now, most important thing, of course, this marks a key place in Milan. And these buildings, as we designed them, I had in mind not so much the Milan of the past, but the Milan of the future. The connection with the past is, is by designing a very public Italian piazza in the middle of the project. Not so Milanese, but very Italian, to have a, a piazza in the middle of the project. But the project, it looks to the future. This responds to the visions of the people of Milan that are so future-oriented. That's the diagram, and we have put the lower buildings towards the lower uh, buildings in the city. And the larger build, building, the second largest faces the station that has no scale, and the largest one faces the park that is a very large park. So that the, the, the size of the building is responding to the context of the, that the building encounters. And that's just to show a diagram of how that spire was built. The spire is, is almost 30 meters from the roof of the building to the tip. And that's how it looks now. Another view of it. And sometimes this is all you see of Milan. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, this, this has been for me a great pleasure and a great honor to work in such a wonderful city as Milan. I love coming to Milan. I love eating in Milan. I love walking the streets of Milan. So, and now I love walking in, in Porta Nuova in Milan. So, th thank you all very much. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. <laughs>